morning. Welcome to Matins with Noodle. And Noodle's very, very present this morning. Um, honestly, I think he just likes to hang out in front of the screen right before we start. And then I pay attention to him. And then I start paying attention to you, and he starts doing things like rustling around the plastic bag. Noodle, make better choices, please. Anyway, I am delighted that you have joined us this morning, and we'll be continuing looking at animals in scripture. Um, let us begin. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall proclaim your praise. I invite you to join me in singing the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Christ all creatures here below. Praise God above ye heavenly host. Creator, Son, and Holy Ghost. So I don't know if you know this, but this is one of the songs that you can sing while you're watch it, washing your hands. And that's the right time span to get your hands all nice and clean and washed with, you know, warm soap and water. So just, you know, something to keep in mind. It's very helpful. Let's pray. God of all creation, as the tail follows the cat, may your spirit go with us, go with us this day. Dynamic, playful, a part of who we are and yet free from our own imperfect desires and demands. May you surprise us with your grace Startle us with your presence and abide with us throughout this day and every day. Amen. Um, we will now sing a couple of verses of a song called God of the Sparrow. It's 740 in your ELW if you happen to have one kicking around. And I actually learned this hymn when I was running with the Presbyterians because the church that I grew up in... Oh, good morning, Barb. Why, thank you. It's so good to see you. Um... The church that I grew up in, and good morning, Judy, didn't really have much of a choir program, but the big Presbyterian church in town did. And so rather than, you know, switch churches because, you know, my parents were Lutheran by golly, they just sent me to sing in their choir. So every Sunday, you know, a few Sundays or so, I would miss, you know, Lutheran church because I would be singing in the Presbyterian choir. But they taught me this song, and it's one of my favorites. Let's see if I remember how it goes. God of the sparrow, God of the whale, God of the swirling stars, how does the creature say oh? How does the creature say praise? God of the rainbow, God of the cross, God of the empty grave. It also had this beautiful descant, which I absolutely loved, but seeing as this was only me, I can't really do the descant with you guys. But one day, maybe we'll sing it in church. All right. So our reading today, we're going to stay in Genesis for a while longer. Genesis does have some of the best animal stories, especially in the beginning. So today we're going to be learning a little bit more about our friend, or maybe our enemy, or maybe our frenemy, the serpent. Let's see. Now, the serpent, we're reading Genesis chapter 3. Now the serpent was the most cunning of all the beasts of the field that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Though God said, you shall not eat from any tree in the garden, and the woman said to the serpent, from the fruit of the garden's trees we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat from it, and you shall not touch it, lest you die. The serpent said to the woman, you shall not be doomed to die, for God knows that on the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will become as gods, knowing good and evil. 
And the woman saw that the tree was good for eating, and that it was lust to the eyes, and the tree was lovely to look at, and she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave to her man, and he ate. And the eyes of the two were opened, and they knew they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves and made themselves loincloths. And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I ate. And the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed be you of all cattle and all beasts of the field. On your belly shall you go, and dust shall you eat all the days of your life. Enmity will I set between you and the woman, between your seed and hers. He will boot your head, and you will bite his heel. <clears throat> yeah, not really not a good day for anyone in creation, but definitely not a good day for the serpent either. Now I'm going to have to sing you another song. Spiders and snakes, spiders and snakes, I'm going to learn to love them no matter how long it takes. So in the category of useless stuff that rattles around in Pastor Emily's brain, I will include this chorus of the song we had to learn when we were in first grade and we were learning about spiders. But the song included snakes, so you know we also sang about them too. And I don't remember any of the verses except that they were very informational in nature about spiders swimming what spinning webs and snakes having scales and when i was in first grade i and my classmates oh morning mom especially loved to sing this song because our first grade teacher miss gold said she hated snakes and so we just thought this was the funniest thing ever that we got to sing about these things that she hated but Whatever rattled Miss Gold about snakes is hardly rare. There's something about that slithery motion that just bothers us. The way that something that should be just like a piece of rope or a stick suddenly wiggles and runs away. It's deeply unnerving. Snakes bother us. But according to Genesis 3, snakes were not always so. They were not always slithery. It's not until the end of the story that the snake is condemned to spend the rest of its life wriggling around on its belly. When we first meet the snake, we then might imagine that the snake walks up to the women on little snaky legs. I mean, hold on to that image of a walking and talking snake for a moment and take this moment to accept that while the Garden of Eden was certainly good, this pre, you know, sin paradise, good and weird are not necessarily mutually exclusive. And back before the fall in paradise, well, snakes could walk. And I'm not honestly sure how I feel about that, but there you have it. Now, Later, Jewish and Christian interpreters and theologians will insert Satan, the devil, as an additional character in this story. In his own serpentine fashion, Satan slithers into the serpent. It is an infernal puppeteer, or maybe partnership, that causes the snake to trick the woman. But the story itself does not actually mention the devil. All that is said is that the snake is cunning, the most clever of all the beasts of the field, and clearly too clever for its own good, because the snake ends this story just as badly off as the man and the woman, crawling on its belly for all time, destined to bite humans and then to be crushed by them. That is how Eden ends. We know this story with blame and consequences, and the snake is part of all that. 
However, it is worth noting that while the man and the woman spend a fair amount of time sorting out who is at fault for all that has happened, you know, God starts with the man and the man says, well, it was the woman, this woman that you gave me. And then, you know, God turns to the woman and says, well, you know, what do you have to say for yourself? And she says, it wasn't me, it was the snake. The snake never really gets to say his piece. You know, the snake never really gets to speak a word in his defense. The snake doesn't blame anybody. And at this point, we know that the snake can talk. You know, this is not a secret. We've heard him talking already. And if the snake is so very, very clever, why doesn't he use his snaky little wits to slither out of this dreadful situation? Maybe it is because that the snake is smart enough to know that he cannot argue his way out of God's justice, something that we as human beings are still trying to figure out. Maybe, unlike the woman and the man, the snake is past that problematic, deeply annoying phase of sin denial and has moved on to repentance, that change of heart. And maybe the snake's sentence of crawling on his belly and eating dust is simply that, a life lived in repentance. But if that is the case, can we allow for the serpent, the snake, the evil of evils to be redeemed? I mean, can God even use the snake? Well, yes, God does. God uses snakes repeatedly for God's purposes. Moses demonstrates his authority as God's messenger by throwing his staff to the ground before the Pharaoh where it turns into a snake. In the wilderness, God sends poisonous snakes to bring the resentful Israelites to repentance. And at the very end of the Gospel of Mark, the disciples are promised that as a sign of God's protection, they will pick up poisonous snakes without being harmed. Definitely not my particular piety snake handling, but you know, to each his own. But. What I would suggest is that before we go trampling snake heads willy-nilly, we take time to learn from the snake's example. Sometimes we need to take the time to sit in our dust, our mistakes, our failings, the reality that we are human and we are mortal. More often than not, it is when we are intimately aware of our dust that God reminds us that even so, we are loved. And for the sake of the gospel, there is work for us to do. Yes, we are dust, eating dust, just like that snake. But within our dust stirs the breath of God's life. And that breath still stirs within us and maybe it stirs within the snakes as well. Let us pray. Almighty and nourishing God, you have brought us safely into this day as a mother cat carrying her young. Care for us and sustain us every second, minute, and hour of this day. Thoroughly cleanse us from sin and lead us moment by moment that we may serve you and one another. In your strong name we pray. Amen. I invite you to join me in saying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I hope that you have a blessed day. Go in peace and be well.